All right, well, good evening, everyone. I apologize. A couple minutes late, I had a catastrophic failure on my other laptop, so I had to pull out the old laptop and try and get everything loaded up on this laptop. So I guess being two minutes late is not all that bad, uh, considering all of that happened. But um, hopefully you can hear me. Hopefully you can see me. Hopefully you can see the the slides on the screen. And so I think that um, we should be we should be good to go. If for some reason you can't hear me or if there are any connectivity issues, please let me know and I'll try and shut my camera off to see if that helps at all. But um, my, my Zoom workplace on the other computer just was simply not working about 10 minutes before class. So that's always panic mode. But um, well, welcome to week number four. I hope everyone is doing well. Hope you're having a good week so far. I know it's only Monday, but hope your week is off to a good start. Um, let me just do a couple of housekeeping things first before we get into our topic for tonight, which will be accountability and ethics. So the first thing to mention is that, as you all probably know, you have the accountability and ethics paper that is coming due on September 22nd by midnight, which is next Sunday. Uh, in that paper, what you'll be doing is you'll be identifying an ethical issue that you are familiar with. It doesn't have to be an issue that you're personally involved in or an issue that you witness firsthand. Uh, it can be really any ethical issue that concerns a public official, a public organization, a nonprofit organization. And what you'll do is you'll identify that ethical issue that you're going to talk about, then talk a bit about the issue itself and what happened to the issue, who was involved in the issue, um, what types of um, uh, principles were violated in that in that ethical example, uh, how you would have responded differently if you were in that situation. And so it just allows you the opportunity to just explore an ethical issue. It could be at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level. Again, it is completely up to you. And uh, it'll just give you an uh, a opportunity to kind of expand on this ethical issue and then to incorporate some of the information that we're covering tonight to help you then hopefully better address that issue. Uh, let's say there's a question from Skyler. Uh, whoop, things are going by very quickly. Let me scroll back up here. Okay. And if multiple types of accountability are involved, should we explain all of them or choose whichever one applies the most? Uh, if all three of the types of accountability are involved, fiscal accountability, process accountability, and policy program accountability, then you can go ahead and discuss all of those if they're all involved. If two of them are involved, discuss those two. But you can also highlight, you know, if one is more involved than the other, then you can always you know, talk about that as well. But yes, uh, please do identify those. Um, let's see, if multiple types of accountability are involved, should we, okay, I already did that one. Um, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Bell's, and we'll talk a little bit about Bell tonight. I think a lot of people have uh, certainly lived through the Bell example, and that's certainly an example that's that's a, a tragic one, but it's a good one that you can certainly use. Uh, it can be a broad ethical issue, or does it have to be a specific real example? You know, those specific real examples, I think, tend to work better for this paper than just something more broadly. I think if it's a specific example that affected a specific organization or a specific individual or group of individuals, I think that usually works, works better for this type of paper assignment. I am also very flexible in terms of some of the parameters that I placed on the assignment in the syllabus. And so I believe the assignment parameters say five to 10 pages. That is just there kind of as a guide because people, and rightly so, always ask how long should this paper be? Uh, if you can address all four of those major points and you can do it in less than five pages, that's great. You know, we're all about being concise and being parsimonious, so that's absolutely fine. If it's a much more elaborate, much more layered type of issue, it's going to take you more than 10 pages. Um, I'm not going to stop reading at 10 pages. And so just however long it takes you to address those four points in the assignment uh, will certainly be good enough. So you don't have to worry too much about adhering to those, those page guidelines. The other thing that I'll also be flexible on it's in terms of the number of peer-reviewed journal articles. I think in the assignment parameters, it says something to the effect of 10 peer-reviewed articles. Now, depending upon the ethical issue that you're discussing, it may be very hard to find 10 peer-reviewed journal articles focusing on that 
ethical issue itself. And so if you don't have 10 articles, I'm not going to deduct points if you're under 10. Uh, just make sure that with the sources that you're using, please do make sure that they are trustworthy, credible sources, but you don't have to scramble around to get to 10. If you have four or five and they apply to the issue that you're discussing, that's going to be absolutely fine. I am much more in, interested in the quality of the assignment as opposed to the quantity of sources you're using or the quantity of pages you're turning in. I'm much more interested in the quality of the assignment. So let's make sure that you hit on each of those four requirements spelled out in the assignment um, uh, requirements in the syllabus. As long as you address all four of those requirements, then you will be in good shape. Do make sure to proofread the paper. Uh, for your resources, any resources you're using, please do make sure to use APA formatting. I'm not going to deduct points necessarily if you don't italicize the journal title or if you capitalize each of the words in an article title. I'm not necessarily going to deduct a lot of points for that, but I think that we covered it um, when we talked about the uh, week two posting that you did when you identified five journal articles. We kind of talked about how to go about APA and and the, the kind of nuances, if you will, and the quirks in APA seventh edition. But, you know, trying to buy by APA, but I'm not going to be a big stickler on that. But please do make sure you proofread the paper. Um, any other questions or clarifications on that paper assignments? This is coming due very, very soon. Okay. As you are working on that paper this week, if any issues emerge, feel free to send me an email and I'm more than happy to answer any of those questions. Also tonight in the second half of class, I have it scheduled for us to do some breakout rooms. And in those breakout rooms, we'll do an exercise very similar to what you were doing in the paper. So kind of stimulate your thinking about some ethical issues that you might want to consider using as the topic for your paper. So hopefully the breakout rooms will help you start writing your paper. Then also, in addition to this accountability and ethics paper, you then also have another Canvas essay that's coming due. I believe it's Canvas essay number four. That one also looks at accountability and ethics. And so in that one, what you'll be doing is comparing public sector versus private sector ethics. Tonight, we'll talk a lot about what we call the ethical shock of ethical upgrade as people move from the private sector into the public sector. They are sometimes shocked by the ethical regulations, the numbers of rules and, and different procedures that they have to follow. And sometimes that shock of ethical upgrade could actually deter some people from making that move from the private to the public sector. So in this Canvas essay, you'll talk about some of those differences in private sector versus public sector ethics. What are some of the implications of having higher ethical standards in the public sector as compared to in private corporations? You know, what does that mean in terms of uh, the likelihood of someone to join the public service? What does it mean in terms of being effective and being creative and innovative in what we do as public administrators? Discuss some of the challenges that and how to overcome some of the challenges in implementing these higher ethical standards. We'll talk tonight about some of the obstacles that we have to overcome in order to implement these higher ethical standards in public and nonprofit organizations. And so you're also going to be talking about how to overcome some of those obstacles. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. Are they, well, something in texture could, the, could be the other way around as well. We're coming from public and going into private. Uh, it could be shocked by lack of rules and regulations. Yeah, absolutely. If anyone that's ever gone from a public sector organization into a private sector organization, you'll notice that lack of rules and regulations that you had to follow in the public sector. So you're absolutely right. It is very much that two-way street between the two sectors. So again, you've got your paper assignment that's due for next week uh, on Sunday, and then you also have your Canvas essay number four, as always, responding to the first, the, my initial prompt and then responding to two of your classmates. I've already gone through and read Canvas essay number three. I haven't provided feedback on every single post. Uh, I was kind of limited this week in my ability to do that, but I really want to get grades back to you. 
everyone did very well in Canvas essay number three. So the approach you used on numbers one, two, and three, just continue using that approach moving forward. And you'll be absolutely fine then on Canvas essay four and then the Canvas essays as we move forward throughout the course. We are in week four, which is kind of hard to believe. It means that after this week, we are now, we're now officially one half of the way through our unusual semester together. So we are an abbreviated semester, an eight week semester. So we're halfway through after this week. Uh, so, you know, do be mindful that as we continue through our final four weeks of the course, you then have these other assignments that are coming due as well. You have your multimedia uh, assignment. We can talk more about that one next week once you get through this paper assignment. Then we'll talk more about that assignment. Uh, then the final assessment assignment that's coming due then as well at the end of the class. So uh, assignments start to move a little bit quicker uh, in the second half of the class than they did, obviously, in the first four weeks of the course. So tonight, what I have planned is kind of do that lecture lab type of orientation that I like. We haven't really had a chance to do that much yet here in this class. But in the first half of class, we'll talk about accountability and ethics in the public and nonprofit sectors. Then when we're done with that, we will take a break. Then after the break, we'll come back and we'll get into our breakout rooms. And then we'll go through this assignment I have for us in our breakout rooms. Probably spend about 30 to 40 minutes working in our breakout rooms. Then we'll reconvene as a class. Uh, each room should select a spokesperson, and then the spokesperson can then share what the, each room came up with. And then we'll kind of see the similarities and differences in the thinking between our different rooms. We are a very large group, obviously. I think we have 36 people in here so far tonight. So I don't want to have a ton of groups because we have a ton of breakout rooms. Sometimes it gets a little difficult to manage. So I think what we'll probably do is do maybe four breakout rooms, uh, eight or nine people in each one of those rooms. And then I think that'll probably work pretty well for what we want to do in the second half of class. And then once we're done with all of that, then we may get out a little bit early tonight. If we get out early tonight, then we'll just reserve the rest of the time tonight for you to start working on your accountability and ethics paper that's due on Sunday. So let's get into accountability and ethics. And again, we're going to do it with the nature of this class in mind, in that we are an introductory foundational type of class. It's an introduction to contemporary public administration, which means that we basically just introduce this idea of accountability and ethics in the public sector. And then in future courses in the program, you will then get more and more of a taste of accountability and ethics. So tonight is just creating the basic foundational understanding of accountability in the public sector that you can then build on in your future courses. So we're not gonna get into a lot of the granular details in ethics and accountability, just kind of introduce the topic, get that tip of the iceberg from that 30,000 foot type of level. So I think we all have a very good sense of what accountability is in the public sector. Most of you currently work in the public sector, so I'm sure your individual organizations probably have a code of conduct or a code of ethics that you have reviewed. And some of you may actually serve on review panels. And so you're probably very familiar with the idea of accountability and ethics. But when we are holding people accountable, we are looking at this inherent relationship between people and things. So when you hold someone accountable, you are holding them accountable for their relationship with things that they are managing or interacting with. So in a public administration program, when we're talking about a relationship between people and things, the people we're talking about are obviously going to be the administrators. The things are going to be either the resources that they manage or sometimes the stakeholder groups and the individuals that they come into contact with and interface with on a daily basis. So administrators obviously build relationships with external stakeholders. They build relationships with other employees, with leadership and management. So Tom, sometimes we're looking at the relationship between administrators and other people and other groups. Sometimes we're looking at the relationship between administrators and the financial resources that they are managing. So we're looking at how they manage public taxpayer money, how they are managing their budgets. Is this money being spent in the legally appropriated manner in which it is supposed to be spent? You've probably done 
audits in your organization. So you're familiar with different types of audits. Financial legal audits are typically used to make sure that money is being spent in its legally appropriated way, that it's being spent the way in which the legislature intended for that money to be spent. Then we oftentimes will do performance and management audits. Performance and management audits will not just ask, how are we spending the money, but it will ask, how well are we spending the money? So we'll look at, is spending money on this program helping us achieve our goals and our objectives? Kind of what we'll talk about a little bit later on as policy or program accountability. Sometimes we're not just managing money, obviously we're managing human resources. And so there can be ethical implications to how we are match our human resources, but we're really looking at this relationship between administrators and the types of things that they manage and the individuals and groups that they come into contact with. Holding administrators accountable for their actions is the foundation of bureaucracy. Because when you think about the relationship between administrators and the public compared to the relationship between elected officials and the public, the connection between administrators and the public is much more tenuous in that we do not have that direct linkage through elections. We get our jobs based upon merit. We get our jobs based upon our KSAs, our knowledge, skills, and abilities. We are not directly elected like members of a legislature would be. And so therefore we have to have a mechanism, kind of a connective tissue that will hold us accountable to the public. That connective tissue is oftentimes those elected officials, since elected officials are directly elected by the public. The problem though, is that sometimes that connective tissue breaks down in that elected officials sometimes do not want to hold administrators accountable. Because once they hold administrators accountable and they can engage in accountability, accountability usually has a negative connotation that once you hold somebody accountable, you're going to end up discovering problems. And elected officials don't want to discover those problems because once those problems are discovered, then they're going to be tied to those problems. And we know the primary motivation of most elected officials, especially those in Congress, is to get reelected. And so the more problems you are associated with, the less likely it is you're probably going to get reelected. So there is a natural incentive for elected officials to keep their distance from accountability and from holding administrators accountable. If they don't see the problems, then they can't be held accountable by the voters for those problems. So elected officials, since they are hesitant to get involved in accountability, we sometimes don't have that clear chain of accountability where elected officials are willing to hold administrators accountable for their actions. When elected officials hold administrators accountable for their actions, we know that as the oversight process. We know that legislatures have oversight responsibilities over administrators. Congress has oversight responsibility over members of the federal bureaucracy. State legislatures have ultimate oversight responsibility over members of the, uh, of the state bureaucracy and so on and so on. That oversight function can occur in a variety of different ways. One way the oversight function can occur is oversight by legislative review committees. So a legislative review committee can call in an administrator or call in members of an agency to come before them and testify as part of this oversight function. And we see that happen all the time. Uh, if um, Usually you don't have to issue a subpoena because they're members of the federal bureaucracy, so they will come willingly. Usually they'll come willingly because they know they have to be politically responsive. Being politically responsive is one of the primary values of public administration. They know if they can provide this information to admit to elected officials, then elected officials may be more likely to loosen up those purse strings and provide them with more appropriations. But legislative review committees conduct a lot of this oversight over federal agencies and departments. The second way in which Congress conducts oversight is through the appropriations process. Now, if you know about the public budgeting process, you know that at the federal level, we basically have two tracks to the federal budget. We have what's called an appropriations process and what's called an authorization process. 
the appropriation process is for discretionary spending. So any types of programs that Congress has direct control over, where Congress can directly increase or decrease spending on those programs, those are referred to as discretionary spending programs, and those discretionary programs go through the appropriations process. So the House and Senate Appropriations Committee, and there's an Appropriations Committee in the House and the Senate, each of those Appropriations Committees will have 12 separate subcommittees. Each one of those 12 subcommittees will have a different area of guaranteed jurisdiction. So you'll have a House Subcommittee on Appropriations for uh, Health and Human Services, one for Agriculture, one for Defense, and so on and so on. Each of those subcommittees will then conduct hearings and markup of their respective appropriation bills. And during that hearing and markup process, they will call in members from those departments to come and testify in that appropriations process. Then when those 12 appropriation bills get passed up by the subcommittees up to the parent appropriation committee, then the parent appropriation committee in the House and the Senate will then go through their own markup and revisions type of a process where they will again conduct oversight through holding these appropriations hearings. And so there's a lot of that oversight that's done through the appropriations process. As we always say, Congress's primary power is the power of the purse strings. So Congress can tighten up the purse strings or loosen up the purse strings depending upon what their policy priorities are and the relationships that they have formed with these different departments in these different agencies. But then running alongside the appropriations process is what's known as the authorization process. The authorization process is intended for what we call mandatory spending. So mandatory spending would be spending that Congress does not have direct control over. So spending on things such as interest on the debt, once Congress borrows money, Congress must repay that money, must make those principal and interest payments, or else it will default on the debt. Defaulting on the debt would be a very bad thing because that would completely destroy the credit rating of the federal government. You destroy the credit rating of the federal government, the federal government would no longer be able to borrow money, would no longer be able to balance its budget, would no longer be able to engage in capital improvements. So you can't, you can't default on the debt. So you have to pay those principal and interest payments. Those are beyond the direct control of Congress. Once Congress issues the debt, once they borrow the money, they have to pay that money back. Uh, another example of mandatory spending that I'm sure you're very familiar with are entitlement programs. Entitlement programs, for example, like Social Security. Social Security is an entitlement program because it's eligibility-based. So in order to get your social security benefits, you must meet a minimum retirement age and you must be vested in social security. If you meet those two requirements, then you are legally entitled to those social security benefits. Congress, if it wants to reduce the amount of money it's paying on social security, cannot do it directly. It has to do it indirectly by changing eligibility requirements. So you increase the retirement age, fewer people are then eligible for those benefits, and in turn, you then end up spending less money on Social Security. So that goes through what we call the authorization process. So through legislative review committees, through appropriations, as well as through authorization, those are three ways in which Congress can exert its oversight responsibility over the federal bureaucracy. Oversight is something that's very important for ensuring accountability and ethics. However, the problem with oversight is that we have this little thing called the principal agent relationship that I think we've introduced earlier in a previous session. We're going to talk about more at length um, next week when we get into an environmental analysis of public administration. But just to kind of recap, the principal agent relationship says that you have these two actors in this relationship. You have a principal and you have an agent. The principal oversees the actions of the agent. So in this instance, obviously it's Congress that's the principal as the agency that, or the department that is the agent. In a principal agent relationship, you would assume that the principal would have the requisite information that it needs in order to oversee the actions of the agent. As we know, the primary issue in the principal agent relationship is information asymmetry. 
that the fact of the matter is the agencies oftentimes have more information than the principals. Agencies have more information than Congress. If agencies are doing this program and policy implementation on a daily basis, then no one really knows better what's going on on a daily basis in that organization than that agency itself. That agency, because of this principal agent relationship, and this information asymmetry, then has what we call a moral hazard that it must deal with. The moral hazard is agencies then have to determine what information and how much information to give to Congress. There is a disincentive to provide a lot of information to Congress because the more information that you provide to Congress, the easier it becomes for Congress to oversee the actions of the agency. So by giving information to Congress, you are facilitating more scrutiny and a closer inspection of what you are doing by Congress. So that's kind of this moral dilemma, this moral hazard that members of agencies face in the principal agent relationship. Now, when we look at the American Society for Public Administration Code of Ethics, we will talk about the eight principles. And one of those eight principles is to fully inform and advise. So one of the ethical principles that we are held accountable for is to fully inform and to advise the overseers, members of Congress or state legislature, so they have the adequate information to then hold us accountable for our actions. But you can see how this is a moral quandary that a lot of agencies and administrators can run into. And that if they don't give the information to Congress, that will then detract from Congress's ability to engage in oversight through this principal agent relationship. Another obstacle for oversight is this idea of executive privilege. And we have seen executive privilege being exercised more frequently of late by presidents. So presidents will step in and say, we are going to shield this information under executive privilege. This is information of a conversation or communication between this member of the agency and the president. And since the constitution says in article two, that presidents can require the opinions of executive officials, this is a constitutional power of the president. So the president can then uh, exert executive privilege and say, this is privileged information that I will not allow this agency member to reveal to Congress. The more executive privilege actions you see on the part of presidents, the more difficult it is for Congress to get information out of agencies that it needs to hold those agencies accountable, accountable for their actions. So even though we have an oversight, and that oversight is meant to ensure accountability and ethics, there are these obstacles that we have to overcome in properly overseeing the actions of administrators. Accountability and ethics and ensuring accountability and ethics is all about striking this tenuous balance. This balance between controlling the actions of administrators so that work will get done, but then freeing them up and giving them flexibility enough to make sure that the job is not just getting done, but it's getting done well. So we always have to balance rules and regulations with the need for flexibility so that administrators don't feel that they take a creative risk. They do something innovative that they are gonna run afoul of some rule or some regulation. Very strict accountability standards not only may make it difficult for administrators to do their jobs effectively, but will also, as we said before, make it more difficult to attract people into the public service. It makes it more difficult for us to attract, as we oftentimes like to call the best and the brightest, into public service. So this enforcement of ethics, if you will, this enforcement of accountability, is a dynamic concept in that our ability, our perceived ability to enforce ethics has really morphed over the past 150 years. If you go back to the late 1800s, the approach that we took to enforcing ethical adherence on administrators is oftentimes referred to in the literature as the legal boundaries approach. In the legal boundaries approach, we kind of adhere to the politics administration dichotomy as discussed in the Woodrow Wilson article. And so we all know in that Woodrow Wilson article, the study of administration, it really gave us this jumping off point 
for a rationale for studying administration as a separate field of study. It really gave us the, the framework for a discipline of public administration. And the way in which Wilson made that argument is, if we want to make government more efficient, what we need to do is separate politics from administration. Once you separate politics out of administration, then you can study administration in order to better do what he called the business of government, because you make it look and act a lot more like a business once you've taken politics out of it. So then we can borrow those innovations from England and from these other civil service systems around the world and apply them to our administrative structure. So we draw this line between the political world and the administrative world. Now, when you draw that line between the political and the administrative world, it gives you these legal boundaries that you can use for identifying what is considered ethical and what is considered to be unethical behavior. So if you have administrators who cross that line, you have administrators who start playing in the political world, that can be considered to be unethical because they have now crossed over from the administrator side into the political side. So you kind of had this nice little barrier between the two worlds, this nice little legal boundary that would give us a pretty clear cut definition of what types of actions are considered ethical versus what are considered unethical. If they're remaining within the administrative realm, chances are they're acting more ethically. If they cross over to the political realm, that's where they could run the risk of engaging in unethical actions and behaviors. But as we also know from a discussion a couple of weeks ago, that this politics administration dichotomy is certainly not absolute. And so Wilson wrote his article back in 1887. About 50 years later, in the 1930s, we really started questioning the validity of this politics administration dichotomy. And people like John Gauss, as early as 1936, started talking about how there really isn't this distinction that the laws that are written on the political side by the elected officials are oftentimes not terribly clear and they're impossible to translate into action. So under your politics administration economy, elected officials write the laws on the political side and then it's up to the administrators on the administrative side to execute and implement those laws. Well, if you got vague, ambiguous laws that are coming out of the legislature from the political side, the administrators aren't going to know how to implement those laws. And so they'll start writing the rules and the regulations that will interpret how those laws are supposed to be implemented. Once you have that process going on, you then have this bleeding over between the political and the administrative world. And so as early as the 1930s, we realized there really wasn't this true distinction between politics and administration. And so when you have of a blurring of the lines, it becomes much more difficult for you to say, this action is unethical, this action is ethical, just because one was done in the political world versus one that was done in the administrative world, because those two worlds really are not separate from each other. And so sometimes we refer to that era beginning in the 1930s as the era of the political challenges, recognizing that it's challenging for us to separate politics and administration. Actually, it's really impossible for us to separate those two worlds. So it becomes much more difficult for us to say, yes, this is universally ethical. This is universally unethical. So it becomes a much more difficult uh, approach to trying to ensure ethics and accountability. Today, we recognize that it's even more difficult than it was in the 1930s and the 1940s. And today, we recognize that our application of ethics and accountability really is much more contextual in nature than what we were led to believe back in the legal boundaries approach of the politics administration dichotomy. We've come to realize that there is no one single professional norm that can really be applied to every single public agency because each public organization has its own unique culture. And as we talk about the development of the public administration literature, one of the schools of thought that we'll spend a good deal of time talking about is organization culture. And we'll talk about how the School of Organization Culture postulates that every organization has its own unique set of norms, expectations, and behaviors, its own culture. And so since or each organization has its own culture, 
and its own expected set of norms and behaviors, it's probably going to need its own code of conduct, its own code of ethics, and that is what we have seen today. Uh, in the Obama administration, the Obama administration required that every federal agency and every federal department develop its own Office of Inspector General, or OIG. So every federal entity has to have its own Office of Inspector General. And one of the reasons for that was this recognition that every organization operates differently. Every organization kind of has its own organizational culture. So the moral of the story here, you know, I love the so what question. So, well, so what? The answer to the so what question is that ensuring ethical adherence has become very messy today. There's not one single standard that can be applied completely across the board. Every organization is a little bit different depending upon its mission, its goals, its uh, primary functions, whether it's engaged in direct administration or indirect administration. It really does depend, which gets me to my favorite answer, which is it depends. Uh, Monica in Texas, do you think it's easier for a new person to adapt to that set culture or for an already set culture to adapt to something new? Great question. I think it's much easier for a new person to adapt to a culture than to have an already established organization culture change. Changing organizations, that's a really important point, changing organization cultures is very difficult. It's a very gradual, protracted process. And it's also a process that for a leader will require a lot of political capital. If you are a new leader who comes into an organization that already has a set culture and you try to embed a new culture into that organization through either primary or secondary or tertiary embedding mechanisms, it's going to eat up a lot of your goodwill. You know, a lot of leaders come in and they have a honeymoon period of time. The honeymoon period of time could be gone very, very quickly if you try and embed a new culture that is very much different than the existing culture. It takes a long time. It takes a lot of work and it takes really strong leadership skills to really embed a new culture into an organization. In my time, in my university, I have seen, I've been there 24 years now. I have lived through seven different dean administrations in 24 years. I had to count them up. I'd lose count after a while. But mm -hmm. seven in 24 years. Uh, usually uh, dean administrations last on average about three to four years. And one of the reasons for that is that deans come in with all these great ideas that they're going to embed into the culture. They run headfirst into an existing culture and a tenured faculty who really have their heels dug into the ground and are very resistant to it. And they kind of, you know, try and push that rock up the hill for a few years until they get frustrated and realize that it's just not getting over that hill. And then they look for greener pastures. And so I think that it's really difficult to embed a new culture into an organization. I think that's a great point. So thank you for that, Mike. That's a great point to, to make. So the way in which we've tried to implement ethics in the public sector certainly has changed over the years and it's become a much more contextual, much um, muddier, if you will, process of ensuring ethics. And now today we see individual organizations develop their own code of conduct. We do see a lot of overlap between these codes of conduct because if an organization doesn't have its own code of conduct, oftentimes it's going to engage in looking at other organizations' codes of conduct and kind of build off of those. But there can be some differences between the codes of conduct between our organizations, depending upon those unique organization cultures. Now, what is really germane for this accountability and ethics paper is one of the things that I ask you when you're identifying this ethical issue is to talk about what type of ethical issue is it? What type of accountability is it? And the literature tells us there are basically three different elements or three different types of accountability. The most widespread, the most common type of accountability is fiscal accountability. This is where we hold people accountable for how they're spending the public taxpayer money. Are they spending the money in the legally mandated way? We know that one of the primary differences between public and private organizations is this thing called the Anti-Deficiency Act that says that public organizations can only spend money in the legally mandated way. They can only spend money in ways that the law allows them to spend the money. Whereas in the private sector, they can spend their money 
pretty much anywhere they want and however they want, as long as they are not violating the law. So unless the law says you can't do it that way, private sector can spend it much more freely. In the public sector, we can only spend our money on what the law specifically tells us we can spend that money on. I think that's a really good example of these differences in accountability between public and private sectors. Um, I don't know if I had mentioned it in a previous class session, but we had a good test of the Anti-Deficiency Act pretty recently in the Trump administration. And in the Trump administration, we had this situation where uh, we had a budget impasse. And we've all become very familiar with the budget impasse and a budget stalemate. Um, we're experiencing one right now in the House of Representatives. But we had a budget stalemate where Congress could not come to agreement on all 12 appropriation bills. I think they could come to agreement on maybe six of them. There are still six that were not agreed upon. And the fiscal year ended on September 30th, and the new year fiscal year begin, began on October 1st. When that new fiscal year began on October 1st, those areas of spending under those six unpassed appropriation bills no longer had legal authority to operate. So therefore, Congress passed what they call the continuing resolutions. And those continuing resolutions would say for all these agencies that have not had their new appropriation bills passed yet, they have the authority to continue operating at 80% of what they operated at last year, and we'll let them do that for the next two weeks. That then buys Congress two weeks to keep working on the appropriation bill to hopefully pass it and get it to the president for the president's signature. Those two weeks expire, Congress then passes another continuing resolution. And sometimes that next continuing resolution will be for a month. So it would give Congress another month to work on trying to pass this appropriation bill and so on and so on. So you have this series of continuing resolutions throughout the fall and running into December. Then we hit January. And when we hit January, you had a real impasse between the president and Congress. You had the president saying, I will no longer permit these continuing resolutions. Uh, the imperative is you must come to an agreement. But Congress is still unable to come to an agreement. This was at the same time that you had the new tax cuts that had just gone into effect, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, this landmark piece of tax legislation passed in the Trump administration that changed tax rates, it eliminated exemptions, it placed a limitation on the SALT, the state and local tax deduction limited to $10,000, created some additional deductions, and so really a whole scale change to the federal income tax code. Well, people are getting ready to start filing their taxes in January. And so people didn't really understand how this new tax code affected them. So they got their phone out and they called up the IRS. And guess who didn't answer? The IRS, because the IRS was partially shut down. It didn't have its appropriation bill. The Treasury appropriation bill had not been passed. And so they are operating on a skeleton crew. So they no longer have people who are able to answer the phones. And so then there's an outcry from taxpayers saying, we can't get any of these questions answered. So President Trump then said, what I want to do is I want to bring these IRS agents back who have been you know, furloughed because of not having a budget. I want to bring them back and put them back to work answering these phones and then pay them using money from something that was appropriate to another area of spending. Well, Congress and a lot of other people said you can't do that because the Anti-Deficiency Act says you can't. Unless you have money appropriated to the IRS to pay these agents, you're not going to be able to bring them back and pay them. And then the other option was, well, we'll bring them back. We won't pay them. We'll just work them and then we'll pay them in the future. Well, you can't do that either. You can't work people without giving them a pay. And so that was basically the end of that attempt because it was a violation of the Anti-Deficiency Act. So it's just a, a real life example of how the Anti-Deficiency Act really shows us a difference between public and private sector organizations. So we can only spend money on what money is legally appropriated for, holding people accountable for how they're spending the money, that's fiscal accountability. When we see ethical violations, it's usually those fiscal accountability types of violations that we tend to see. People um, having a conflict of interest and in trying to use their public office resources for private gain, uh, perhaps um, contracting, giving contracts to friends and family members for financial gain. A lot of the ethical violations that we've seen recently in LA City Council, and we've seen, it seems like a whole litany of one member after another, 
being brought up on charges of, of ethical violations, and several of them end up going to prison for it. A lot of those fell within this fiscal accountability type of, of accountability. A second type of accountability is process accountability. Process accountability is concerned with how agencies are performing their tasks on a daily basis. You can really think about this as a focus on implementation. So how are agencies implementing these programs on a daily basis? So really looking at the process of implementation to make sure that agencies are spending the money efficiently, that they are following the law in terms of you know, who is eligible and who's getting these benefits and when they get these benefits and how they get these benefits. So it really looks at the process of policy implementation. Then the third type of accountability is sometimes called policy accountability. Sometimes it's called program accountability. It depends upon whether you're managing a policy or a program, but it's really concerned with whether a public policy or public program is achieving its purpose as defined in law. In other words, we are looking at, is this program, how well is this program accomplishing its stated goals? So whenever a program is created or a policy is created, there will be goals attached to those programs and those policies. So how well are we making progress toward the achievement of those stated goals? So holding administrators accountable for achieving these goals and having the desired impact and consequences on beneficiaries is a type of accountability called program or policy accountability. So when you are thinking about the, the ethics example that you are using in your paper, think about, does this deal directly with money and how money is being spent? Does it deal with a process of implementing a policy or a program? Or is it holding the public sector accountable for achieving the goals, stated goals in that program or that policy? Admittedly, the vast majority of the violations that you're probably gonna be looking at will probably primarily fall into that first category of fiscal accountability. Um, you think about examples like um, you know, Bob Medendez at the federal level, uh, standing trial for bribery and corruption. Now, a lot of the underlying charges there fall directly in fiscal accountability. You know, all those gold bars that he allegedly received, or I guess he was found guilty, wasn't he? Or I don't haven't really kept up on it in the past few weeks, but uh, that he had these gold bars that he received, a new car that his wife received uh, to allegedly then be a foreign agent for the nation of Egypt. Uh, those are all financial benefits that he was allegedly accruing. Uh, another example is the prominent example is George Santos uh, taking and misdirecting campaign money to use for a variety of um, sundry types of things we won't get into. Uh, that's an example, again, of fiscal accountability. Uh, this is a good question from Monica in Texas. If there is no clear guidance process to follow, is that an ethical violation or concern? Uh, that's a great question. According to an organization's code of conduct, if the code of conduct is silent on that, then it won't be the organization's rules that will carry the day, but there could be state laws that prohibit that, and there could be federal laws that prohibit that as well. And certainly that would be something that would be prohibited under the ASPA code of conduct. We think about at the state level, you know, we have um, state level regulations about things such as conflicts of interest. And so if your individual agency doesn't speak to conflict of interest, but you're still a state or local employee, you're still going to fall under those conflict of interest regulations under the Political Reform Act here in the state of California. So even though it's not in your organization's code of conduct, it is something that could still very well be covered under state or federal law. So, but that's a good question, because sometimes these organizational codes of conduct uh, are not terribly specific, and there are a lot of loopholes that you can kind of drive a truck through. But always remember, overlaid upon that, and probably even more importantly, overlaid upon that, could be state and federal law. Speaking of state and federal law, and that's a wonderful segue then into our next slide. Some of the ways in which we can try and make sure that people are adhering to ethical rules and ethical expectations is to try and find this balance between 
external rules and regulations and the character and training of our administrators internally to the organization. So we've got a lot of these external rules and regulations. We've got you know, Whistleblower Protection Act, and there's one here in California. We have California Labor Code 1102.5, uh, the Political Reform Act. There's really a myriad of all these different external regulations that we can use to try and hold people adherent to ethical expectations. However, if you've got all these rules and regulations in the world, but you have administrators who do not have the character, the public service ethos, and the requisite training to understand what is ethical and what is unethical, you can have all the rules in the world, but you can't guarantee that someone's going to follow those rules. Usually whenever we see a major ethical violation, that coverage is because we have found out someone has violated those rules. But for every one person who is found violating the rules, there could be a dozen other people who are violating those rules quietly in the dark that we don't know about. So you not only have to have a set of external rules, but you also have to have that internal character, that public sector ethos and adequate training so people understand what is ethical and what is not ethical. Yeah, and not to get too much, to digress too much, but one of my favorite examples of what, what used to be considered ethical versus unethical is Tammany Hall. And we may have mentioned in a previous class, I'm getting old and sometimes I forget these things, but uh, it's really an interesting body of literature to look at the political machines that governed our large cities in the 1800s and the early 1900s. And you've probably heard of Tammany Hall, the largest political machine we had in this country that governed New York City. Uh, one individual in Tammany Hall, George Washington Plunkett, wrote his memoirs called Plunkett of Tammany Hall, where he talked about there are two type, different types of graft. Now, the word graft today, we would think of as corruption. We use a synonymous with corruption. So someone's engaging in graft, it means they're engaging in corruption. Plunkett made the argument that there's both, there are two different categories of corruption. There's what he calls dishonest corruption and what he calls honest corruption. So dishonest corruption, according to Plunkett, was I just, I take money out of the, the local coffer. So there's money the city has. I steal that money. I embezzle it. I put it in my pocket. That's dishonest corruption. And that is something that even he said should be avoided. But he said on the flip side of the coin, there's what he calls honest graft or honest corruption. And he gives us this example that will say, for instance, I find out in the course of my public duties that the city is going to buy up this land and make it into a city park. So based on that information that I get from my public position, I go out there, I buy that land in advance, I then sit on it for a while, then the city has to come to me and I charge the city an exorbitant price, I make a good bit of money, I see my opportunity and I took it. That he considered to be honest corruption. He was just using the information he got in his public position to then allow him private gain. Today, we certainly would call that dishonest, and we would certainly call that corruption. We would call that a conflict of interest that would clearly violate one of the major principles in the ASPA Code of Conduct, and he would probably end up being brought up on ethics charges and losing his job and perhaps even going to jail. But in the late 1800s and early 1900s, that was an acceptable type of thing to do. Today, if we saw an employee engaging in that type of corruption, then we as employees would probably have the responsibility to blow the whistle on that type of corruption. It's important for us in order to make sure that people are following these external regulations that you have others in the organization who feel comfortable enough and protected enough to blow the whistle on those violations, to bring those violations to light. Because again, for every one person that gets caught, there could be 12 other people doing the exact same thing. But if we not empowered and protected people in the organization to blow the whistle, to be what we call the voice of ethics, people who blow the whistle in their organizations are known as the voice of ethics. Uh, we want them to stay in those organizations because if they will stay in those organizations, they will continue to be the voice of ethical adherence and they will continue to point out these ethical violations, these illegal, sometimes illegal activities. If we don't protect them, then they're going to exit the organization. And if they leave the organization, that does us absolutely no good. 
because oftentimes to see these ethical violations, we have to be within the organization itself. We have to have eyes within the organization. These people exit, we have now lost eyes within the organization. So it became very clear very early on at both the federal as well as here in the state of California that we needed to legislate whistleblower protections. So we needed to protect people who disclose these ethical violations. We needed to protect them from retaliation and retribution. So at the federal level, we got the Whistleblower Protection Act. Uh, Whistleblower Protection Act today is about 34 odd years old. It's been reauthorized multiple times over the years, but that Whistleblower Act protects federal officials when they blow the whistle. Here in California, we have a similar act called the California Whistleblower Protection Act, which does some similar things here in California. Uh, here in California, the whistleblower protections kind of run through the state auditor's office and the state attorney general. So what will happen is if someone blows the whistle, that claim will then go to the state auditor's office. The state auditor will then investigate that claim and then refer that claim to the attorney general for um, implementation, basically for uh, the attorney general then to implement the remedies and to stop the retaliation. So it's the attorney general who really has the legal standing to be able to enforce these anti-retaliatory measures. The state auditor is the one who really does that preliminary investigation and then refers it to the attorney general's office. At the federal level, if you're a federal employee, you mostly blow the whistle to what's called the Office of Special Counsel. And the Office of Special Counsel is an independent investigatory agency, which is now independent. When it was first created back in 1978, it was within the Merit Systems Protection Board. In 1990, it was given independent status. And so you would blow the whistle to the Office of Special Counsel. You could also blow the whistle to members of Congress if you wanted to. You could blow the whistle to the Merit System Protection Board if you chose to do that. Uh, if you felt comfortable enough, you could blow the whistle to managers and to leadership within your organization, to your agency's Office of Inspector General office that every agency has. Uh, some people feel more comfortable going directly to the media, but there are lots of ways to blow the whistle. The primary administrative route is through the Office of Special Counsel. Office of Special Counsel will then investigate that claim and if they find that there is merit to this whistleblower claim, that yes, indeed, there were ethical violations and that this whistleblower is facing retaliation. So the agency or whoever the whistle was blown on has decided, I'm going to demote this person. I am going to reduce this person's hours. I'm going to give this person poor performance evaluations. I'm going to deny this person professional development opportunities. Those are all considered to be retaliatory efforts against the whistleblower. OSC would say, yes, our investigation has found that these retaliatory efforts have occurred, would then give it over to the Merit System Protection Board. Merit System Protection Board would then go in with the remedies. And so the Merit System Protection Board could provide a variety of remedies to the whistleblower, things such as giving them back pay if they were dismissed from their position, back pay if they were demoted to a lower paying position. Uh, all those types of things are remedies that can be provided to those whistleblowers who try and make those whistleblowers whole. And so those whistleblowers will feel comfortable staying within their organizations and then hopefully blowing the whistle on any future ethical violations as well. I have put links, and we're not going to go to it right now, but I have put links into the slides if you are interested. I've got a link there for a fact sheet on the Federal Whistleblower Protection Act. I also have a link there to the California State Auditor site that describes the California Whistleblower Protection Act. Um, I didn't link it, but if you want to see a lot more details in terms of some of the ethical prohibitions against things like conflict of interest for agency officials, you can find that under California Labor Code 1102.5. Then what I've also done here is I've also linked for you what's called the Political Reform Act here in California, as well as an ethics guide that's produced by the Institution for Local Government. Again, we're not going to go there for the sake of time, but I've provided those links. You can go and take a look at those at your leisure. The Political Reform Act here in California was passed in 1974. 
And the Political Reform Act from 1974 empowers the Fair Political Practices Commission, otherwise known as the FPPC, with investigating ethical violations, not just for elected officials, but also for candidates, as well as for what's termed agency officials. And so the definition of an agency official in the Political Reform Act is essentially any official who works in any public agency at the state or the local level that has decision-making authority over an issue within the jurisdiction of that area. So if you are a public administrator and you have some type of decision-making authority, for instance, over contracting and awarding contracts, you are then covered under that conflict of interest section of the Political Reform Act. So a lot of people think when they hear Political Reform Act, it only deals with candidates and campaign donations and things like that. But there is a portion of the Political Reform Act that talks about agency officials and limitations on things such as conflict of interest, uh, receiving gain for your own private benefit using public resources. Those types of things are included in the Political Reform Act. And again, the Fair Political Practices Commission is the state commission that is charged with enforcing all those provisions within the Political Reform Act. And as I said, that last link there, this ethics guide, it's produced by the Institute for Local Government here in California. Uh, it's a very lengthy guide, but it provides a lot more details on some specific examples of ethical violations and some of the reporting mechanisms for those, and then some of the remedies that are also attached to any of those, to rectify any of those ethical violations. But the really important part of this is that in order to ensure ethical adherence, we really have to balance both all these types of ethical rules and guidelines with having administrators who really value public interest over private interest and really have the requisite training to understand where that ethical line is and then endeavor to not only not cross that line, but to stay as far away from that line as possible. And we've seen a lot of ethical violations at the federal, the state, and the local level as an elected official for six years. Um, I got to witness firsthand some of these ethical violations, and one of my colleagues actually ended up being charged with a couple of felonies for uh, misappropriation of funds when he double billed his employer for a trip that was paid for by the school district and tried to get compensation reimbursement from both the school district as well as from his employer. And his employer happened to be another educational organization. Uh, and so at the, at the university lo college level, and so actually got charged with a couple of felonies and I think pled no contest. I don't think he did any jail time, but I do think he got community service. And then, you know, once you are a felon, then you are prohibited from running for uh, public office in the future if that felony dealt with a violation of public trust. You know, if that felony dealt with misappropriation of funds, you know, double billing of the government, uh, embezzlement, fraud, any of those types of things, those types of felonies would then preclude you from seeking office, either local or state office, in the future. So we do have these very high ethical standards in the public sector that, as we said at the outset, can create the shock of ethical upgrade when people go from the private sector into the public sector. And as was pointed out in text chat, uh, there's kind of also this ethical downgrade as well as you move from the public into the private sector. And again, we're not saying that as a pejorative hit, if you will, on the private sector. You know, there's no hate for the private sector. It's just that because we are dealing with public taxpayer money, public resources, it just makes sense that we'll have more regulations to be held to higher standards in the public as compared to the private sector. Um, Susanna has a point in text chat. Let me move my text chat here. Uh, since measuring progress in policy accountability requires a combination of quantitative and qualitative data, as well as consistent monitoring and evaluation activities, are there specific general tools or formulas to measure and monitor the progress? Absolutely. Uh, this really gets you at the issue of program evaluation. And a lot of program, I believe that I've taught a program evaluation here in the CSUN MPA program. I'm not sure if that's going to be part of your curriculum or not. But in program evaluation, yes. 
you know, we have a variety of different tools we use, primarily mixed methodology, because as you correctly mentioned, measuring these, these indicators of progress toward accomplishment of goals, that usually requires both qualitative as well as quantitative indicators that we combine together into mixed methodology. So some things can be measured quantitatively. So if we want to measure the number of families that benefited from this general assistance program this year as compared to last year, that's going to be a very quantitative measure. That's something that's relatively easy to measure. However, if we want to measure people's attitudes, people's perceptions, uh, their perception about their quality of life and how this public program may have enhanced their quality of life, that's obviously going to be a lot more qualitative in, in nature. So we're going to need both a quantitative as well as qualitative measures combined together into mixed methodology. In collecting that qualitative information, we can use survey methodologies. We can use thematic content analysis. We can use focus groups. We can use um, interviews. Uh, we have a variety of different methods that we can use for qualitative Quantitative program evaluation has really become highly sophisticated today compared to how it was 20 or 30 years ago. So for our quantitative analysis, we're probably going to use things like multiple regression, uh, some degree of econometrics, we might use past survival analysis, logistic regression. So we've really become very sophisticated in terms of the types of methods that we use to measure those quantitative indicators of program or policy performance. And so I think it's a very important point that we have to be multifaceted in how we are measuring that progress toward achievement of our goals. So when we're looking at the achievement of the goals of a program or a policy, we're oftentimes operating more at a macro level. So how well is the agency achieving these goals that were laid out in this program or this policy? When we are dealing with fiscal accountability, that's when we oftentimes see the more micro level, the more individual level type of analysis. Is this individual administrator misappropriating funds, spending money in ways in which it's not supposed to be spent? So it tends to be a little bit more micro level when we are doing that fiscal accountability. So in Achieving this ethical adherence in applying these ethical standards, as we said before, we really have to try and strike the balance between being able to hire the best and the brightest and attract people into the public service while still ensuring that the public interest is being preserved. And ethical adherence, the, if you want to take one thing away from this discussion, Tanya, it's that ethical adherence is all about striking a balance a balance between external and internal rules and orientations, and a balance between holding people accountable, but still freeing people up enough so they have the flexibility to be innovative and to be create, creative in what they do on a daily basis. Attracting people into the public service, even with all of these rules and regulations and limitations, is much easier done when people value public service. Now, we are all in a public administration, public affairs type of program. We wouldn't be in this program unless we valued public service. I spent 10 years as a department chair, and so I got to look at all of the applications that came into a program over 10 years, so literally well over 1,000, probably more than that, probably about 2,000 applications over that time. And in looking at those applications, the one thing I always looked at is their statement of interest. So you always ask candidates, why do you want the MPA degree? Why do you want to get this degree? And to a person, it's always about, I believe in public service. I want to make a change. I want to make my community better. I believe in, in public interest. And there's always that kind of altruistic type of reason why people have gotten involved in the public sector to begin with. But to attract more people in the public sector, we really need to have leaders who are willing and able to go out there and be champions of public service. So people like George H.W. Bush, before he became president, he was a lifelong public servant, worked in the Foreign Service for many, many years before he became uh, President Reagan's vice president and then eventually became president in his own right. He believed in public service. He referred to it as being the highest and the noblest of callings. President Obama, when he ran in 2008, said that his goal was to try and make government and public service cool again. 
when you have leaders who champion the public service, it's much easier to recruit the best and brightest into the public service. When you have leaders who don't champion the public service, that's when it becomes very, very difficult for us to do so. People need to understand that the public service is not only very important, it's also very complicated. And it can certainly be a fulfilling vocation because of the potential to impact the lives of everyone in society. As again, when you think about government, when you think about administration, touches every single aspect of everyday life for every single American. So this is kind of what Charles Goodsell argued to us back in the 1970s in his case for bureaucracy, that we need to make the case for the bureaucracy. We need to demonstrate to people why it is so important, why government work is so important, why it is so valued, and that will then help us attract the best and the brightest, irrespective of all these limitations and all these rules and regulations. So it is difficult to ensure ethical adherence when we are working in different organizations that have different cultures and ostensibly different codes of conduct. Fortunately for us as public administrators, we do have one organization's code of conduct that binds us together, and that's the American Society for Public Administration. So regardless of whether we are an engineer, or if you are a financial analyst, or if you are an HR professional, you, when you're working a public organization, you are a public administrator. And so the American Society for Public Administration gives us eight different principles that we need to abide by as public administrators. The first one is to serve in the public interest. Promote the interests of the public and put service to the public above service to oneself. This is clearly something that George Washington Plunkett did not do in his time in Tammany Hall in New York City. So we need to put public interest above our own private interest. Secondly, we need to uphold the constitution and the law. I know we spent part of one class, I guess it was last week, seems like a year ago, but I guess it was last week, talking about the constitution and our system of American government. We are required as administrators to respect and support government constitutions and laws while seeking to improve laws and policies to promote the public good. We have qualified immunity, which means that if we're acting within the parameters of our position in our organization, and we are endeavoring not to violate the constitutional rights of people we come into contact with, then we have immunity from prosecution. But to respect and support constitutions and to not violate people's constitutional rights, we must first know the constitution. And so I hope you've had a chance to go back and refresh your memory about what the Constitution says, especially the first 10 amendments of the Constitution and this whole idea of incorporation and which of these rights belong, are rights uh, against protected against federal government action and how they've then been incorporated to include protections against state and local action as well. The third principle is to promote democratic participation. This can admittedly be a tough one. Inform the public and encourage active engagement in governance. Be open, transparent, and responsive, and respect and assist all persons in their dealings with public organizations. This also has a nice segue or a nice um, connection, if you will, to Charles Goodsell. I just mentioned his case for bureaucracy. Because the other argument that Goodsell makes is the reason why people hold government organizations in such low regard is because of a negative experience that they've had with those organizations. So they may have a, had 10 experiences, nine of them good and one of them bad, but that one bad experience is gonna color their view of government organizations and public service. So what we need to do is we need to help people in their dealings with our organizations. People oftentimes don't know which organization to contact, even which level of government to contact when they have an issue or they have a concern. If, um, if parents want to have a, a stop sign and a crossing guard on a city street, they go to the school board. The school board has nothing whatsoever to do with that. The school board can request that the city do a traffic study the same way that an individual citizen can request that traffic study. But the school board, the school district has absolutely no control over it because those crossing guards are employed by the city, that street is a city street. 
So therefore it's a city requirement, but they don't know that they need to go to the city. So we need to help them with their dealings with government and public organizations. Oftentimes, whenever people have contact with an organization, they're bureaucratic organizations and bureaucratic organizations, we all know, can be very difficult to navigate. Once you even find the right organization, it's difficult for you to be able to find the right person, the right office who can or what can then address your wants, needs and your desires. Um, yeah, and actually I was watching a trial and the prosecutors mentioned that they had qualified immunity. Uh, yeah, uh, qualified immunity applies if they were you know, prosecutors, they are public employees. And so, yeah, they do have that type of qualified immunity uh, in practicing their their uh, their skill, if you will, on a daily basis. So, yes, they, they do have that type of qualified immunity. Qualified immunity is interesting, though, because qualified immunity, the standard changes. It's kind of a, a slippery little thing in that what was considered qualified immunity 10 years ago may not be considered as much qualified immunity today. And one of the things that really helps determine whether or not someone has qualified immunity is the amount of time that they have to make a decision. So if you think about a situation where you have a law enforcement officer and it's a life or death situation, and so they believe that a crime is being committed in this private residence. And so without a search warrant, what you would normally think is a violation of Fourth Amendment, they go into the house because they think a crime is, is occurring. Uh, they made that split second decision. They may be protected under qualified immunity because even though that could technically be a violation of the Fourth Amendment, they had to make a decision for public safety. And so making that decision in that instant may provide you a little bit more protection. However, you think about a case like the Gonzalez versus Trevino case that was just decided by the Supreme Court, or technically decided, they basically punted it back down to the lower court. But in that case, when the police department arrested this city council person, they had a lot of time to think about it. While that person sat in jail, they had time to think about, well, is this a violation of this person's right to privacy? Is this a violation of you know, their Fourth Amendment? Is this a violation of their Fifth Amendment protections? They had not only hours, but they had days and up to a week to think about it. When you have that much time to think about it and consider it, then the standard becomes much higher. And you don't ne may not necessarily have the same qualified immunity protections as you would have if it was a life and death moment being, being made uh, at a given instant. And so this is something that courts are really struggling with, not just the Supreme Court, but lower courts as well. And that's the reason why the Supreme Court has kicked it back down to lower courts to kind of think about that issue of, you know, what is the period of time that would still provide you with these qualified immunity protections? Also, to promote democratic participation, we are supposed to inform the public and encourage their active engagement in governance. We know, as we'll see in our next slide, and you're probably aware of this, we have a Brown Act in this state. And the Brown Act requires that our meetings are open, that they are public meetings, and that those open public meetings, you have to provide time for public comment. And so most agencies, you know, city councils, most boards will provide maybe two or three minutes for each citizen to then get up and address the board on either an agenda or a non-agenda item. So that is allowing people to participate and engage in their own governance. We know that if you have a very hot button item on the agenda and you have hundreds of people there who want to speak on that item, you may not have the time to be able to allow every single individual to speak. That could take five or six hours just in and of itself in order to have everyone um, have their say. And so there can be some limitations that you have to place on this type of active engagement. Strengthening social equity. This is one of the primary values that underpins public administration, along with our more traditional values of efficiency, effectiveness, political responsiveness, uh, representative bureaucracy, protection of individual rights. Social equity is really one that has ro risen to prominence in the new public administration. And this is one of the values that we really place a primary emphasis upon to treat all persons with fairness, justice, and equality and respect individual differences, rights, and freedoms, promote affirmative action, and other initiatives to reduce unfairness, injustice, inequality in society. So strengthening social equity is one of the primary elements of our expected behavior in our ASPA code of conduct. 
Fifth one, fully inform and advise. And this one is going to get us to the idea of the principal agent relationship. Provide accurate, honest, comprehensive, and timely information and advice to elected and appointed officials and governing board members and to staff members in your organization. Even though providing this information, fully informing and advising may make it easier for them to hold us accountable for our actions, this is something that we need to do. This kind of eliminates that moral hazard of what we're going to withhold the information to then protect ourselves from oversight down the road. Demonstrate personal integrity, adhere to the highest standards of conduct to inspire public confidence and trust in public service. This speaks to what's called the expository role of public managers and leaders. As um, Mark Moore tells us, we have an expository role in that we need to be role models. If we can role model integrity and high standards of conduct, that will then help the public believe more in not only us as administrators, but in governmental organizations as well. To promote ethical organizations, strive to attain the highest standards of ethics, stewardship, and public service in organizations that serve the public. So we want to try and make our organizations ethical organizations. Whether that means changing the organization culture, as we had talked about earlier, whether it means revising or completely replacing your organization's code of conduct, we need to work toward making our organizations more ethical. And then number eight, to advance professional excellence, to strengthen personal capabilities, to act competently and ethically and encourage the professional development of others. That last clause can, somewhat, can be somewhat difficult, to encourage the professional development of others. Sometimes information is viewed as being a resource in organizations. If you're the only one who knows how to do a job, that information is power. And that's kind of protection for you in your job. But when we think about the organization as a whole, it's important for us to encourage the professional development of others so that we can create these succession plans. So that as we continue with the graying of the workforce and we continue to have uh, traditionalists, baby boomers who are retiring and moving out of our organizations, as we have Gen Xers who are getting closer to retirement age and starting to think about moving out of their organizations, we need to be willing to encourage the professional development of others so they have the requisite skill and training to then move into these leadership positions. That's what will help us deal with what's been known for years as the retirement tsunami that really hasn't been as much of a tsunami as has been kind of a gentle wave over the past 20 years. But that wave has really certainly accelerated post-COVID. That people, once they went through the COVID pandemic, some people thought, I don't want to work in these agencies anymore. I want to go out there and you know start my own business. So I want to go out there and you know be an artist or whatever they want to do. And they've been leaving your organizations. And so we are starting to see more of an uptick in terms of this retirement tsunami. Here in California, we know that we really do value openness and transparency. And we know that compared to a lot of other states, we have a lot more rules and regulations that require us to do the public's business in the public. The Brown Act that we've already mentioned requires that meetings need to be conducted in public. So your city council meetings, your school board meetings, your regional water district meetings, uh, those need to be, be held in public. When they're held in public, you need to have a time for a public comment, public participation. We have to publish our agendas and then adhere to those agendas. So those agendas must be published at least 72 hours in advance. And then during those meetings, that city council can only discuss and take action on those items that are on the agenda. Purpose for that is the agenda signals, signals the public, here are the types of issues that this body will be talking about. If you're interested in these issues, then you can come to the meeting and participate in that discussion, or at least participate in public comments. If we start talking about issues that are not on the agenda, then the public does not have notice that these issues are going to be talked about. So we have to publish our agenda 72 hours in advance, unless it's a special meeting or an emergency meeting. That's a shorter time. That's a 24 hour period of time. But typically a regular meeting has to be published 20, 72 hours in advance. All these issues under the jurisdiction have to be discussed in open session with the exception of a handful of issues that can be reserved for closed session. So issues such as personnel issues can be done in closed session for privacy reasons. 
uh, issues such as security types of things. So uh, when I was board president, we were uh, we were going through um, the hardening of our schools. And so we had uh, a, a company that we worked with and that company, we would meet with them in closed session. They would point out vulnerabilities in all of our facilities and then how to rectify those vulnerabilities. Well, you certainly don't want to go out there and you certainly don't want to say, um, here are all the vulnerabilities in ABC elementary school for everyone in the world to hear, because that's going to make you much more vulnerable. And so that could be done in closed session. Um, uh, discussions with our legal counsel that could be done in closed session uh, to a degree. If we are dealing with surplus property in terms of talking about surplus property, the very beginning stage of that can oftentimes be done in closed session. But then the declaration of a surplus property that has to be done in, in open session. And you cannot start in closed session. You have to go in open session first. You can then go into closed or executive session, uh, but you cannot start in closed or executive session. Uh, Tyler has a question here. Are there any requirements for what might constitute an emergency meeting? Absolutely. And the Brown Act is very clear on what is an emergency meeting. An emergency meeting is some unforeseen circumstance that the board or the council could not see in advance that has a direct impact and immediate impact upon public safety. So if it's something that's unforeseen and has a direct immediate impact on public safety, then you can have an emergency meeting. Those emergency meetings don't have to be noticed because they are emergencies, but they, uh, if you do have an emergency meeting and you call the emergency meeting without noticing it, uh, you're going to get a lot of scrutiny from people. So you better make sure it's an unforeseen circumstance that has an immediate direct impact upon public safety. Uh, if you're doing a special meeting, it's a 24-hour uh, notice. If you're doing a regular public meeting, it's a 72-hour notice. And so the Brown Act is, is pretty specific on those types of things. If it's a regular meeting, it has to be done in public if a majority of the legislative body is going to be in attendance. So if you have five city council members, three of them are going to be in attendance. That's going to have to be agendized as an open meeting. Now, this has led to some consternation among legislative bodies like city council, school boards, and similar. In that there is a, an exemption in the Brown Act for ceremonial, so any cere purely ceremonial function, you can have all five members of your city council at a ceremonial function. So for instance, if you have things such as a opening of a new school, and so we have an opening, we had, we opened a new school when I was on the board and we had a ceremony ribbon cutting for opening of the new school. All five board, board members could be there because there's no discussion of, of um, school district issues or decisions being made. It's purely ceremonial. There's also an exemption in there for if you're going to conferences. And so once per year, our board would go to the California School Boards Association Conference, either in San Diego or up in San Francisco. All five of us could go to that because it was conference attendance. Now, the stipulation there is while we were at that, meet, that conference, we could not enter into discussions and debate about issues within the jurisdiction of the district. That would then end up being a violation of the Brown Act. And yeah, and during COVID, we saw a lot of these changes to the Brown Act that were made, changes that allowed for teleconferencing. And in the past, um, before COVID, if I wasn't going to be in a board meeting, if I was, if I wanted to attend the meeting remotely. And so I did a lot of site visits for NASPA. And so I'd be like in Michigan at the same time we were having a school board meeting. I still want to attend the meeting. I want to do it virtually. Under the Brown Act, what I would have to do is we would have to put that on the agenda that I was attending from this location and include the address in Michigan where I was attending from. And then in the hotel where I was going to attend the meeting from, I had to contact the hotel manager in advance, ask them to put a notice up on the door saying that the um, uh, school board meeting for this school board is being held on this day and this time. And you can attend this from this room. And they gave me a conference room in the hotel. And so anyone could just come into that conference room and sit down and listen to the meeting. Uh, that's a requirement that used to be under the Brown Act that has been loosened because of COVID. And so now members can actually attend uh, via via teleconference. And I've seen that happen more and more in recent board meetings. So there have been a lot of those types of changes and amendments. But the Brown Act really does provide us with this requirement that meetings need to be open so people can then participate in the business of the people. 
We also have requirements here. I know I'm running a little long here, so I'll wrap this up quickly. Uh, we also have requirements here for public records. And so we have a Public Records Request Act, uh, California Public Records Act, that allows for the public to request governmental records that are responsive to an issue. So if you have a member of the public who has a question about a contractor and contracts that have been provided to that contractor, they can then submit a public records request. That public records request could then say, I would like to request all of the documents over the past five years that deal with this specific contractor or this specific contract. The agency then has 10 days to respond. Doesn't mean they have 10 days to provide all the documentation. Gathering this documentation may take a long time, especially if you have like a five years that you have to find. So within 10 days, you have to respond and say, thank you, we have received this request. We are compiling the information. We expect to be able to have the information available to you within 21 days or whatever the case may be. And that would then be legally allowed under the California Public Records Act. Members of city councils, members of school boards have to be very careful that the San Jose case says that even your personal devices are discoverable. And so if you have a cell phone and you receive your personal cell phone, you receive communication from another board member or communication from uh, the city manager on a responsive issue that's responsive to this public records request, you would have to give that information up. If you don't have any information that is responsive on your cell phone, the city will probably ask you to sign a legal affidavit where you attest under penalties of perjury that you don't have any responsive information on your personal device. If you're in a reportable position, you then also have to fill out a conflict of interest form, a Form 700. Um, all elected officials, for the most part, have to do a Form 700. Uh, some administrators have to as well. So for instance, in the Cal State system, administrators that are what we call MPPs. Those have to be in reportable positions. They have to fill out these Form 700s as well. Form 700s, you have to report any potential conflict of interest. And so you don't have to report your primary residence, but if you have any investment properties, you have to report those. If you are gaining any income from employers that are located within your jurisdiction, that's a potential conflict of interest. If you own any stock in any companies that could be doing business with your district or your city, that would be something that's reportable on Form 700 as well. If people don't file their Form 700, then there are fees, there are fines that can be applied, and those fines are pretty much immediate, and those fines are not really very appealable either. You can appeal them, but chances are the appeal will be denied. I know I've gone a little long here, so just to really quickly wrap this up with one last slide. The moral here is that accountability in the public sector really does require striking a balance. It requires to not only strike a balance between external and internal rules and orientations, it also requires us striking a balance between holding administrators responsible for their action, while at the same time freeing them up to make good decisions, to make our organizations and our policies and our programs as effective as possible. We also have to balance holding people accountable with the ability to attract the best and the brightest into the public service. I think the important thing here is to recognize that it's not all about rules and regulations. It's about incentivizing people and getting people to work in the public sector who are willing to live within these parameters while at the same time working to try and meet the demands of the public to make their organizations and programs as effective as possible. You cannot come down too much on one side or the other side of the equation. You really need to strike this proper balance. So again, that's just a very, very tip of the iceberg, not getting into a lot of detail in terms of accountability and ethics, but just to kind of whet your appetite for it as you move throughout the program. And you'll then kind of layer on top of that uh, ethical approaches within the context of each of the courses that you take. So if you take a policy course, you're going to have an ethical component to that. Uh, if you take a, a leadership course, there are ethical components in leadership, an HR course, ethical components in managing personnel ethically, and so on and so on. So you're going to incur, you're going to encounter ethics again and again as you move through the program. This is just kind of a baseline foundation for all of us. It is 7.36, so let's go ahead and take a break. Let's say, let's take a break until 7.50. 
Come back at 7.50 and then we'll spend some time in this breakout room exercise. I'll go through what we're going to do and how we're going to do it once we get back from break. So come on back at 7.50 and we'll do some breakout rooms. All right, everyone, welcome back. Hope you had a good, I'll be a very brief break. Uh, now we'll do our breakout group exercise. I think you've listened to me talk more than enough for tonight. And so I thought it'd be a good chance to allow you the opportunity to work together and to talk a bit. So what I've done is I've created four groups. I know it means we'll probably have about nine or so in each group. Yeah, about nine, maybe 10. And so what I'm asking each group to do is to consider a recent example of an ethical violation in the public or the nonprofit sector. This could be at the federal level, the state level, the local level. It's completely up to you. It could be something very high profile. It could be something that's maybe not quite as high profile at the local level. It's completely your choice. So as a group, agree on one example of an ethical violation and then give a very brief discussion of what happened in this situation. Make it as brief as possible. What ethical principles the group feels were violated by this ethical violation and then how the group would have addressed the problem differently. And so what could you have done or would you have done to address this ethical violation differently than it was addressed in real life? If each group could select a spokesperson, because what we'll do is we'll spend about half an hour working on this in our groups, then we will reconvene as a class. Each group will have a spokesperson who will then share out the answers to those questions for their group. And we'll see what similarities and differences we have and what types of ethical problems the group selected to focus on. Uh, I will give you a time warning. And so we have five minutes left in our group work. I'll post that into each breakout group and say five minutes remaining. Then I'll give you a two minute warning. Then when I do close the rooms, that will then give you 60 seconds to leave that room and go back into our main uh, room of the night. So that is our breakout room exercise. Any questions on that before I send you off into your rooms? Okay. Then I will open the room so you can go to your assigned room. Like I said, we'll spend about half an hour working groups, and then we'll come back together as a class. So the rooms are now open. 